I mentioned this game quite a lot in the last video when talking about Silver Ball, so it's finally time to give Epic Pinball a look. As you can tell just by looking at it, this game came directly from Silver Ball, being a new revision of James Schmaltz's game engine with a set of newly designed tables. As it happened, the release schedules lined up so that Silver Ball was actually released slightly after Epic Pinball was, but it's easy to tell by comparing the two that Silver Ball was the first attempt. This upgrade is much flashier and more ambitious than its predecessor in many ways. Epic Pinball built on what Silver Ball had started, and was released in gradual phases to eventually feature an enormous 13 tables. Their designs are much more complex than the ones that Silver Ball had featured, and the older tables look very blank by comparison. These ones feature all kinds of ramps, multi-layered lanes, spinners, bells and whistles, and have much more complicated rules and objectives to achieve. Fortunately, a new rules option on the table menus attempts to explain what you're supposed to be doing on each one. The instructions on screen at the moment are for Pot of Gold, a table based on what people outside Ireland think Irish folklore is like, and which has a mind-boggling system of hitting objectives to advance through modes named after the colours of the rainbow, which change the behaviour of the table. Android is probably the most famous table, having featured in the shareware version. In the registered game, it's upgraded to Super Android, which contains a couple of small extras over the regular version, and some bug fixes to do with sound and music. In it, your objective is effectively to install Microsoft Access on the shiny blue Schwarzenegger-esque Android in the middle of the table by completing several paths of targets. To activate the physical limbs, you have to repeatedly hit the awkward hole on the lower right of the table and roll over the three light bulbs on the left. And to upgrade the Android software, you have to activate the link by rolling the ball up the ramp on the right, then get further objectives by hitting the middle left ramp and completing the various tasks given to you there. Meanwhile, you can also accumulate points for sufficient code coverage in your unit testing by getting the ball up the difficult ramp on the far left, and raise the Android's IQ to Stephen Hawking levels by hitting the bumpers. Deep Sea is the table that I found the most success with, perhaps because I was playing with a low table angle so the ball was easier to control. It isn't quite as complicated as Android, and instead seems to be based on you reacting to events as they come up, getting to certain ramps or targets within a time limit to accumulate bonuses. And towards the bottom of the list of tables, you have several very crowded ones that get visually extremely complex. One of these is Cyborg Girl, whose music contains this interesting sound sample that doesn't play in full in the song. If you are under 18 or my mum, you might want to cover your ears at this point. Oh, right there. Suffice to say, I don't think the origin of this sound had the same family-friendly rating as the rest of the game. Though I'm not familiar with any of them, apparently some of the tables available are loosely inspired by real-life tables. One notable exception is Enigma, which was inspired by a large amount of recreational drugs. It's a table that would be impossible to replicate in real life, and takes advantage of the computer format to behave like pinball in a fever dream, where you advance through different colour cycling backgrounds by hitting absurd targets like lollipops and shoes. It's also unique in having obstacles on the field that can cause you to lose a ball without it rolling off the table, like large pits of spikes that pop up in inconvenient places. However, it makes up for this by having no in-lanes, kickers or out-lanes, meaning that there's much less chance to drain unless the ball goes SDTM. I'm not going to go into the details of all the other tables here, because we would be here for the rest of the week, but if you're interested in an in-depth look at how they all differ and the best setup for them all, Chris Asics' Ancient DOS game series has a great video guide to the game in episode 130. Obviously, with such an enormous variety, some tables are regarded as much better than others, but the overall quality is generally high. Around the time of Epic Pinball's release, it was regarded as among the best of the PC pinball games, and judging by a look around the internet, it's still very fondly remembered by many people today. Epic really went all in on this game and made a ridiculous number of distinct paid versions of it available, so if you're enthusiastic about owning physical copies of your DOS games, getting the complete Epic Pinball will be like going on some sort of fantasy quest to assemble the fragments of a magic talisman. When the game was originally made available as mail-order shareware in 1993, it was split according to shareware tradition into three parts. The shareware version, which was just Android, and then two episodes called Pinball Packs, which had four tables each. Pinball Pack 1 contained Android, Pot of Gold, Excalibur and Crash and Burn, and Pinball Pack 2 had Magic, Jungle Pinball, Deep Sea and Enigma. A retail version that included the eight tables from these packs was also translated into Polish and distributed in Eastern Europe under the title Flipper. This was published by Xland Games, which Epic would partner again with later this year and will be coming up in a later video.
At some point during all of this, two of the tables were re-themed and were then backported to Silver Ball, being added to the original set of tables to form the re-release Silver Ball Plus 2. In 1994, a third pinball pack was made available, featuring the new tables Cyborg Girl, Pangea, Space Journey and Toy Factory, which were primarily designed by graphics artists Misko Iho and Joe Hitchens. In addition, many of these tables and the previous ones were released individually through various promotions and partnerships, and you could bolt them onto the base game if you didn't already own them. Then finally, in 1995, a CD version of Epic Pinball was released which contained all the tables that were included in the pinball packs, plus one more bonus table called African Safari. You can get this frankly unhealthy amount of Epic Pinball from GOG.com. At the time I'm writing this, the complete collection is available to buy for $6. In addition, most of the tables were remade into a game called Retro Pinball and released by Fuse Powered Inc. on iOS in 2011. All of the tables are redrawn with high resolution graphics, and they're laid out so that you can play them in portrait mode without the screen scrolling around. I also found a couple of adjustments interesting, such as the power-up hole in the Android table spitting the ball back down onto the right flipper instead of the left, so that you can't hit it repeatedly. The first few tables for Retro Pinball are free to download, with many more available for a small fee. Naturally, it also attempts to take your money via the usual mobile game wank, where it encourages you to continuously pay microtransactions to buy more virtual balls and be allowed to continue playing it. Play ball. This next game is another one that I'd never heard of, and I only found out about it by chance while I was paging through Epic Pinball's help screens and noticed an unfamiliar baseball game on the bottom right of the previews section. Thinking that this was an abandoned prototype that never saw release, I had a quick search around on the internet to see if anything remained of it, and was amazed to find the very much existent Epic Baseball. The game was developed by Micro League Multimedia, who were also involved with publishing Silver Ball mentioned in the last video. Micro League were originally called the Micro League Sports Association, and gave their name to their first game Micro League Baseball in 1984. This would eventually expand into a whole series of titles, and from what I can tell, Epic Baseball seems to be a shareware release of the final game in the series, Micro League Baseball 4, in 1992. Most things I could find on the internet say that Epic Baseball was published in 1995, but it looks far too early a game for that, and the timestamps on all the files say 1993, so that's what I'm going with. I went into this knowing it was going to be a difficult game to review, because I know even less about baseball than I do pinball. Even though the game is America's favourite national pastime, unless you count shooting each other and electing a bloviating turnip in a laughably obvious wig, it was very rarely played where I grew up. Fortunately, this game doesn't ask you to do any simulation of actually playing the game yourself. Instead, it's part of the genre of sports management sims, which are games for people who don't like to admit they're just playing Dungeons & Dragons with the likenesses of overpaid people who knock a ball about a bit. Your job is to look at your player's statistics, build them up, and deploy them as best as you can to create a team that can beat the others statistically and reach the top of the league. You can't do that in the shareware version, however, because you're limited to playing exhibition matches here, which is American for a friendly. From the game setup screen, you have two options for how the game plays out, either to choose a quick match, where the computer just spits out a result immediately for you, or to actually play the game. For the purposes of continuing this video, I'll be choosing the latter of these options. You also have the choice to include graphics or not, which would seem like a fairly obvious decision, but what this really means is whether the game plays lengthy animations for you or not. You can choose the playing teams from six different options, presumably based on historically significant lineups, and apparently select your stadium as well, though this option isn't available as shareware. This version also doesn't allow you to edit player and team names to create your own lineup, but fortunately the teams that are baked into the executable file are very easy to hex edit. Another option that mystified me a bit was set DH rule, which causes the letters DH to toggle on and off on the scoreboard. A quick trip to Wikipedia told me that this means designated hitter, which is a rule that allows a team to nominate a player to take the place of their pitcher while their team is batting. This is useful if they've chosen someone who can throw a ball at 400 miles an hour with his huge bionic forearms, but they get in the way of swinging a bat around. 
With your setup done, you enter the game and you get some pleasant animations of the little men running out to the field and throwing the ball around as they prepare to begin. As the first player steps up to the stumps, or whatever the phrase is in baseball, you're invited to press H for keyboard help. This opens a screen which doesn't help me in the slightest, listing the keys that you can use to give advice to your players on how to handle the next play, all of which would require more research from me than I'm frankly prepared to put in in order to get this video out within the next five months. Some of them involve verbs I don't even recognise, such as bunt, including its variants sack bunt and squeeze bunt, which I think would get you arrested in any other sport. For me, Epic Baseball now becomes a game of number wang, with me shouting numbers to it mostly at random in it telling me whether my pick was any good or not. My already limited usefulness in trying to describe this game is now at its end, although I can say that the animations of the little players are very endearing, especially when you ask them to get into a group huddle where they reconsider their tactics and possibly their management. As you might have guessed, I can barely find evidence of the shareware version of this game, let alone the registered copy, so the best you can do is search around the internet. It's certainly a very niche entry in the Epic lineup, but it might be engaging if you have a particular interest in seeing if you can do a better job than the real teams of early to mid 20th century baseball. Coming up now to just halfway through the year, the sixth game that Epic released in 1993 returns to a more familiar genre for the company. It's a top-down shooter, though it might be more accurate to call it a bomber, which was made by a group called Renaissance who had been active in the demo scene. A couple of its members would stay on to work with more games with Epic in the future, notably the musician Kenny Chow. The anime style of artwork was beginning to become quite popular in America during the early 90s, and longtime Epic artist Joe Hitchens clearly took a lot of inspiration from it for the game's opening sequence. This gives it the honour of being the first game published by Epic to feature hand drawn artwork, though in places the translation to bitmaps hasn't quite been as kind to the line quality as it could have. The animation introduces the game's extremely dark storyline in a world where a unified global security alliance has spent many years fighting pockets of terrorists armed with powerful black market weaponry. As the game begins, a retired pilot from the GSA receives a mysterious warning to get his family out of their home city, but he arrives just in time to see the city obliterated by a nuclear missile launched by the terrorists. In the aftermath, he finds the originator of the message, who is also close to death after another terrorist attack at a secret GSA base, and he uses the information he's given to set out to avenge his family and single-handedly destroy the attackers. What this means from a gameplay perspective is that you fly your ship freely around a top-down scrolling environment with the objective of staying alive against the ground and air defences while destroying all the targets pointed out to you on the radar. You have the choice between an almost unnecessary number of ships from two different selection lists. You can choose from the ships that are only available to the player, or you can press the right arrow on the selection screen to look at the enemy ships from the current scenario as well. However, the ships that are unique to the player tend to be the more worthwhile ones. They mostly follow a pattern of being nimble but fragile and not able to carry much, or heavily armoured behemoths that take half an hour to turn 90 degrees. Once you've selected a ship, you also have the freedom to decide how to arm yourself, choosing from missiles and bombs of gradually increasing size and destructive capability. Missiles are only used for hitting enemy ships, while bombs can only hit targets on the ground. Your health and remaining fuel are shown in the top left corner, and each ship has its own different capacities for these as well. None of them will be able to stay in flight for very long though, as on all but the easier than easy difficulty setting, the skies are absolutely full of a constant swarm of enemy ships which will wear you down very quickly. At any time, you can choose to retreat from the fray and head back to the nearest landing pad where you're given the chance to rearm and refuel, or even select a different ship entirely if you think an alternative strategy is needed. This cycle is really all the game expects from you across its eight levels, just the first of which was available as shareware. The mission maps are absolutely huge and have you taking out somewhere on the order of 30 to 40 individual bases in each one, but there isn't a massive amount of variety to the gameplay to justify the length of them. All you'll be doing in each one is repeatedly making bombing runs into enemy territory, then turning round and zooming back to base again for another try. There isn't really a sense of getting anywhere during the missions, particularly as the enemy ships are generated off screen and will constantly buzz around you like confused metallic bees no matter how many you fight off. There's no way to stop their onslaught by strategically taking out launch pads or ground targets or anything. It can also be quite difficult to precisely line yourself up with anything because your ship doesn't turn smoothly and is limited to flying in only 16 directions, making the bomb site jump around quite drastically with slight movements. 
All of these factors together often make it extremely difficult to keep track of what's going on, when you have to simultaneously line yourself up with a target on the minimap, time releasing your bombs so that they hit whatever building you intend them to, keep an eye on your health bar to look at damage from ground defences, and dodge around enemy aircraft. The game doesn't really address this, but instead makes up for it by overpowering your own ship in different ways to make up for it. As you cycle through the available bombs, two special options are also available to you. There's Escape Mode, which boosts the speed of your ship to make quick getaways, and Shadow Mode, which outright turns you completely invincible for a few seconds. Both of these take a chunk off your fuel gauge when you use them, but I never really found myself handicapped by that and would find myself returning to base more than often enough not to worry about it. Throughout the game, I found the most success by taking the biggest and heaviest bomber ship, loading it up with as many of the most powerful imprecise bombs as I could possibly cram into it, then heading towards an enemy base and turning on invulnerability as I arrived. This let me hammer the bomb button while ignoring the hundreds of enemy lasers pointed in my direction, taking out a fair amount of the base each time. Then I would just turn around to restock myself and do it all again. While I've been down on it for the monotony of its gameplay, Zone 66 is a very impressive game on a technical level. Most noticeably, it uses a custom-written DOS extender that was uniquely developed for the game. A DOS extender is a library of code that sits underneath a DOS game to allow it to access the computer's extended memory above the first megabyte, which DOS itself can't touch for historical reasons about how PCs are architected. One of the most common DOS extenders is DOS4GW by Tenbury Software, which was used for famous games such as Doom, Descent, and countless others, and which you may recognise for the truly horrifying way in which it announces its run into a slight problem. The Zone 66 team wrote their own extender using their demo scene expertise to squeeze all the performance they could out of the hardware, and to achieve speeds and map sizes usually impossible on the popular 386 CPUs of the time. However, this came at the price of making the game a lot more difficult to actually get running. The DOS extender clashed with memory managers that most computers ran on startup to access extended memory, so the game wouldn't run unless those were turned off or a boot disk was created to get around the computer's usual startup routine. The help me file included with the game had a set of instructions on how to do this. Altering your computer's entire boot-up configuration to run one program is pretty unthinkable today, but in the 90s players were more used to having to delve into the technicalities of their machine startup files to find the best setup to support a game. One of the other interesting things about Zone 66 is that it features an almost entirely different soundtrack for owners of the Gravis Ultrasound card. Again, this was a popular music device among the demo scene because of its ability to construct music from digitised samples instead of an FM synthesizer like the more widely used Adlib and Sound Blaster cards. This set of music was available as a separate download specially for Ultrasound owners, because the high quality soundtrack was almost as large as all the rest of the game combined. If you want to hear this soundtrack, the popular DOS emulator DOSBox features Gravis Ultrasound emulation that works with the game, or alternatively there's a video on Anatoly Shaskin's DOS Nostalgia channel that features all one and a half hours of the game's soundtrack back to back. This is another title for which I haven't been able to find a legitimate download, but if you hunt it down yourself you should be aware that an unfortunate bug in the official version makes it completely impossible to beat the second level Ice Wind, as one target is impervious to your bombs. However, a fan called Mark Peterson created a fix for Zone 66, and as far as I can tell, this patched version is the one that you'll commonly find floating around. Right off the bat for this game, I want to mention it has the highly unusual property of featuring absolutely no sound at all, not even through the PC speaker. Therefore, I will fill the background by playing some middies of ridiculous fantasy metal songs. Ancients 1 Death Watch belongs to a category of games that historically never really clicked with me. It's a dungeon crawler RPG in the style of Wizardry, Dungeon Master, or Eye of the Beholder. You build up a party of adventurers who are all surprisingly inaccurate with physical weapons, and you have to make your way through a series of grid-based monster-filled mazes presented to you in a flipbook 3D view. In the early 90s, the PC was full of games of this style being released commercially by Strategic Simulations, Westwood or Silmarils, but very few were released under the shareware model. Epic got hold of this game in a similar arrangement to what they'd done for Bricks. Ancients 1 had originally been released independently for free in 1991 by its developers, who were another Canadian company called Farware. In 1993, Epic updated and re-released it as shareware with a new expansion to the game called Ancients 2 available as the registered version. The Epic re-release touches up some of the graphics and adds a giant ordering information notification to the title screen, along with providing a very welcome but not entirely comprehensive online manual. 
The backstory, as presented to you by a woman who had 99% of the artist's time focused on her breasts, tells of an adventurer who was once saved from being lost in the wilderness by a fairy creature, and his nagging feeling years later that something has happened to her. The link to the story isn't made immediately obvious by the gameplay, which has you forming a party of four characters and venturing into the various levels of tunnels below a needlessly confusing town to defeat the evil force lurking underneath. Your party is made up of characters who can be dwarves, humans or elves, although this seems to make no difference to them, and they can be given one of four classes. There's the physical attack oriented warrior or rogue, or the magic user's mage or priest. Their abilities are specified using four of the six Dungeons and Dragons attributes, which are Strength, Intelligence, Constitution and Dexterity. The game assumes that you know about the D&D rules because while the descriptions of these were provided in the text manual of the original Fireware version, they're curiously absent from the epic re-release. A high strength statistic will allow the character to inflict additional damage, dexterity affects the chances of hitting an enemy and dodging a blow yourself, a high constitution will allow you to recover and gain health points more quickly, and intelligence does the same for magic. These are all randomly generated by a simulated dice roll at the start of the game, along with the characters starting maximum health and magic points and the amount of money they begin with, which in this game is called Dracos. Once you've got your characters, or have opted for the one set up by default in the game, it's time to put them to use by selecting Fernie onward. The town you start in is called Lochlaven, and it's very much the fantasy version of Milton Keynes because everywhere in it looks the same and most of it serves no purpose. Despite being rendered as a full 20x20 tile level, it only has three points of interest – the dungeon itself, the square with the shops, and the Adventurer's Guild, which is a bureaucratic take on levelling as you have to check in with them to cash in your experience points and level up. There are four shops in the square, but you'll only use one of them on a regular basis. In the Equipment and Supplies store, you'll find the standard fare of weapons and armour to equip your characters, and you can also sell off old equipment or other bits and pieces that you found on your adventures. Opposite that, there's the inn where you can spend the night to heal, but the price is steep early in the game and you can also rest in the dungeon without any cost or penalty except a small random chance of entering a fight. On the other side of the street, there's the temple where you can once again redundantly heal characters, as well as get them resurrected at an enormous cost. Finally, there's the casino placed awkwardly next to the temple, which contains exactly one roulette table that gives you a one quarter chance to win double your money back and absolutely isn't worth it without save scumming. Once you find the dungeon at the northwest of the town, you'll quickly notice that it's pitch black and therefore your party is completely doomed immediately unless you happen to have the foresight to put a mage in it to cast a light spell every time you go in. However, I will say that with unusual generosity for a game of this type, you're actually allowed to change the makeup of your party mid-game and send a new batch of adventurers into the dungeon without abandoning your existing progress. This is nice later in the game when magic starts becoming more useful, provided you're willing to train up some additional characters by grinding. You can then swap in and out after you've built the new recruits up so that you can revise and optimise your party. Combat in most of these D&D inspired dungeon crawlers, where monsters are rendered as sprites within the dungeon and fight your party directly, is something that I've often found faintly absurd. With this arrangement, the optimal way to fight is to lead the enemies in a bizarre square dance, clicking to swing your weapons and then sidestepping out of the way before they get the chance to retaliate, then whacking them again when they try to line themselves up by stepping into your line of fire. This game has none of that and presents combat in a turn-based environment almost reminiscent of JRPGs such as Dragon Warrior. Each step you take in the dungeon has a chance of getting you into a random encounter, where the enemy lineup will be displayed at the top of the screen with your characters below them. From there, you choose your actions in sequence from left to right, then the monsters do the same and turns go back and forward until one of you is victorious. There is a maximum of three monster slots, but they'll often be stacked and each individual monster in the stack will get its own turn. The options in combat are obvious enough. You can choose to attack with the equipped weapon, defend to reduce damage to yourself, cast a spell, use an item from the inventory, or attempt to flee. Only the two characters in the middle of your party can use melee physical attacks on the enemy, with the other two forced either to use ranged weapons or magic. The frontliners in the middle will also take most of the damage dealt out by the enemies. You'll quickly notice that thanks to the game's D&D inspiration, your physical attacks will hit the enemies infuriatingly little, leaving magic as the more reliable option even though you have precious few spell points to spend before you have to rest. And if you decide you'd rather not deal with whatever monstrosity has popped up on the screen, every character in combat has to successfully flee individually, but as long as one of them has made it out, you'll avoid a game over even if the rest of the party is obliterated. 
So far, all the standard elements for a dungeon crawler are present and correct, but Ancient suffers from a distracting clunkiness that pervades throughout. The user interface is remarkably awkward in ways that I'm not sure can just be forgiven by the game's age. Indeed, the online help itself suggests explicitly to just work it out by trial and error, which is a very poorly chosen turn of phrase. None of the controls on the screen have any visual feedback to them. Buttons don't click inward, there's no highlight on the action you're about to perform or the inventory item you're about to move, and the only indication you have that you're in a different state is by watching the scroll of text on the top right. In this way, it's strangely like playing a command line based RPG by fumbling through it with the mouse. It's very confusing, for example, when you click on the disc options button and want to save then return to the main menu. You hit the disc icon once, the text comes up on the scroll, and you have to click one of the unclickable looking lines of text to make your selection. Once that selection is made, the options scroll up a bit as your action is acknowledged, but they then become unreactive until you click on the disc button again to resummon the menu. Some of the clunkiness can be circumvented by learning the keyboard shortcuts for everything, but they haven't always actually been implemented. The spell selection screen, for example, doesn't react to the displayed function keys at all. The process of doing anything during gameplay isn't much better. Only half of the normal six movement buttons are provided, and so you can't walk backwards or sidestep. And the simple action of buying a piece of equipment for your character takes about six times as many steps as you would expect. To begin with, the amount of money you have isn't tied to the party, but to each individual character. I believe this approach comes from the Dungeons & Dragons background of the game, but Ancients doesn't offer any niceties to make dealing with this fact easier. You have to select one specific character to buy an item, and if they don't have enough gold for it individually, you have to tell the game to pool your gold first so that it all goes to that one character. To make matters worse, you can't call up the character screen while in the shop, so you can't actually do this without cancelling all the way out to check and then going back in again. It also means that you can't see the amount of gold you have to spend or your current equipment while you're buying new items. To top it all off, you have to remember that while you go through doors in the dungeon automatically, you can't do the same in town. You have to click Use and then the door to re-enter the shop. Therefore, it's easier to habitually pool gold onto one character and buy items with them, and then distribute them to the others later in order to avoid most of this runaround. However, you have to remember that certain items can't be used by certain classes, though the game doesn't explicitly tell you which ones, and you can't move a weapon to your left or right hands at the bottom of the screen like you would expect. Those are just for display, and the real hand inventory slots that you can interact with are the ones at the top of the character sheet. The real punchline to the gold pooling issue comes when you attempt to revive a character at the temple, where you have to give your gold to the dead character so that they can personally pay for their own resurrection. The greater problem that I had with Ancient, however, was its ludicrously slow pace. To move a character up from level 1 requires 500 experience points, and battles near the start of the game provide about 6 each. You're unlikely to survive without high starting stats, and you'll be spending a very long time chipping away at monsters in the starting room of the dungeon, and gathering their pitiful loot before being able to make any kind of progress beyond that. In fact, you may have noticed that in most of these game clips I have ridiculously high numbers of hit points, which I obtained by working out the format of the saved game files and making a couple of strategic edits to give myself more of a fighting chance. This way, I skipped having to spend ages upon ages grinding the characters up to levels where they would be likely to survive. Ancients is an ambitious game for a tiny shareware company like Farware, and the group of just three credited people was able to put together something that imitated an impressive number of elements from fully-fledged RPGs by commercial software companies. However, it contains just a few levels of dungeon, and its short nature is only covered up by the pretty severe balance problems. If you'd like to try it out, the shareware version Ancients 1 is around on the usual places, and you can find Ancients 2 available for play online at archive.org. The registered version also includes a set of maps for the first and second episodes, but they're presented in a dedicated program, so at the time of the game's release you would have had to copy the map down before being able to use it. You might get something out of Ancients if you're a truly dedicated fan of dungeon crawler games, but it will be very hard for newcomers to penetrate at all. I also encountered a pretty impressive reproducible crash when attempting to fire with a sling, but it's possible that this was the result of an oversight on my part while I was cheating.